revelation that sat on him was dead. David Koresh, like Jesus Christ, died aged 33. British followers of Koresh are facing trial for murder. Tonight, Panorama has new evidence about the Waco tragedy. For the great day of his wrath is come. Koresh was an uneducated product of rural Texas. He liked rock music, cars, guns, and teenage girls. But to the Branch Davidian sect, he was the Lamb of God. Today there is dispute about how far he caused his and his followers' deaths, or they were victims of a needless tragedy. The American government has just brought out two new reports providing fresh evidence about the life and death of the man who called himself the sinful Messiah. Koresh lives on in the hearts of such Branch Davidians as survived. Two of them revisit the site of the Mount Carmel Center, their former home outside Waco, as Koresh renamed Ranch Apocalypse. They've come to look for their belongings. Janet Kendrick had been a Branch Davidian for years before Koresh came along. Not much left, is there? <laughs> it's a heap of rubbish. Hard to believe it. There's over 100 people living here. Her husband is in jail in Waco with the other men, soon to go on trial. Sheila Martin lost her husband and four of her seven children in the fire. The site was bulldozed immediately afterwards. Last week, the Justice Department's report reaffirmed that the fire was deliberately started inside. Most survivors dispute that. If the cause of the tragedy is contentious, the scale of it is not. 84 people died here on April the 19th, of whom at least 20 were young children. 12 of the youngest were found still wrapped in the charred bones of their mother's arms. Of all the dead, about 24 were British. And of the adults who left during the siege or who managed to survive the fire, three Britons will soon go on trial for conspiracy to murder the federal agents who were killed or wounded in the initial shootout. Many of the Branch Davidians seem to be educated and articulate people. The question remains, how did people like that come to finish up in the Holocaust that happened here? The Davidians split off from the Seventh-day Adventist church in the 1930s. They take the book of Revelation more literally and believe the second coming of Christ is imminent. Among the wreckage here are the belongings of families who came from Britain and from all over the world. I'd like to have the memories of them. You hate to think at the same time what happened, how they were burning. You hate to think of The government calls them a cult because of their devotion to David Koresh. Mm -hmm. Their spirits are with us and mm -hmm. we've got to keep on going. And their loyalty remains. Having lost your husband and four of your children, you don't think that David Koresh might have been a, an unwise leader, no, a misguided he, figure? No, no he's, he's always been very kind, very considerate, always very mindful of us, and I don't think so, no. But don't you ever feel that he dragged your family into this terrible holocaust no, unnecessarily? Sir. No, sir. I think that we were all there, we all stayed, because we believed that God would take care of us. We still believe that there's going to be a kingdom over in Israel and that David Koresh is going to come back and be the head of that kingdom and that it's going to be a peaceful place. It's prophesied in the Bible. It talks about the heathen being around it and being envious and jealous because they're going to see peace and harmony and happiness. And this is what we are looking forward to. This is why we're not mourning, why we're not, you know, all upset because we know this is going to come. Three British Branch Davidian men are in Waco jail and will be tried for murder soon. I spoke on the telephone to one of them, Livingston Fagan, who comes from Nottingham. This is no different to the Christians that lived back 2,000 years ago. It was either the system or God. That's what uh, the position of the FBI put us in. 
we did not fear death at all. The thing about it is that it's not death in the body that's important to us, it's the soul. David Koresh grew up in the Bible Belt. He was born Vernon Howell, the illegitimate son of a 14-year-old girl. Brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, he would later be expelled and join the Branch Davidians. His mother, now Mrs. Bonnie Haldeman, knew young Vernon's vocation was to be a religious leader. He was a failure at school, but as a teenager he became obsessed with Christianity. He would pray for hours and memorize large sections of the Bible. His mother remembers his growing talent as a preacher. I knew it had to be a gift from God. And all a prophet means is a mouthpiece of God. It's nothing, well, it's just a man, you know. But I felt like God was, was leading me, I really did. It, it amazed me, it was awesome. He described himself as a sinful messiah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, <laughs> he, he, he was a sinful person, as we all are. Um, I think he did not, you know, the way I understand it, you know, Jesus came perfect and everything, but he had a, he had a, a message to give, and he could give it better, I think, because he had experienced so many things, the sins of the world and all this kind of stuff. Waco Sheriff's officers close in on Mount Carmel, not this year, but six years ago. Vernon Howell was arrested for leading an armed attack on the then Branch Davidian leader, one George Roden, who'd thrown him off the property. Shots were exchanged and firearms seized. In a bizarre leadership contest, Roden had dug up a dead Davidian and challenged his rival Vernon Howell to bring the body back to life. In court, the jury concluded that Roden was insane. Vernon Howell, David Koresh to be, escaped conviction because the jury couldn't agree on his guilt. The vital evidence was removed from the Waco courthouse and Howell's guns were returned to him. George Roden had been toppled as Davidian leader. Vernon Howell returned to Mount Carmel with his young wife and a handful of followers, the undisputed leader of the sect. To consolidate his power, he needed new members and his recruiters fanned out across the world. Koresh's closest aide, right up to the end, was Steve Schneider. He flew to London in 1988. He headed for the Seventh-day Adventist College, Newbold in Berkshire. Schneider had been a student here back in the 70s, before he was expelled for getting drunk. Schneider came as, in the Christian community would say, a wolf in sheep clothing. No one knew of him coming. Hardly anyone knew who he was. The first thing he did, he made friends amongst the young men in the college. He was a latter-day John the Baptist, right. preparing the way for David oh, Koresh. Yeah. Okay. A former Adventist himself, Fine. he was well equipped to give the students he met Koresh's new slant on the Book of Revelation. Good. You know, as an Adventist, you know what it says in the Book of Revelation? Yeah. Revelation 14. And lo, a lamb was standing on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Any man that worships the beast and the image, the very same, shall taste of the wine of the wrath of God. He took and things out of context, and everything focused on Armageddon, the end of the world, apocalypse. Koresh zeroed in on this and tried to bring it closer to where we are, to make it more real, so it was uppermost in the minds of all his followers. When Koresh himself came to Britain, banned from Newbold, he had to hold meetings in people's homes. God in the flesh. Do you know who I am? God in the flesh. Newbold College couldn't prevent its students from going along, and some young Seventh-day Adventists were predisposed to be receptive. After all, Koresh's apocalyptic vision, his talk of the seven seals that only the Lamb of God can unlock, sounded like refinements of what they already believed. Dissatisfied with mainstream Christianity, they were impressed by his apparent certainty. But he persuaded his potential British followers with more than just his biblical knowledge. What better sinner knows a sinner than a godly sinner, huh? Gradually, 
the meetings got longer and longer until eventually they began not in the evening but they began in the morning and they lasted from perhaps 10 in the morning until the early hours of the next day. Of course people were very tired. The, the evening I was there there were about 25 people in the room and people were falling asleep. Well, what's the point of holding a meeting that goes on for more than 12 hours? Well, I, I see only one point, and that is to try and confuse somebody, to brainwash them. But those who accepted Koresh's teaching deny they were being brainwashed. Every sin Isaiah says I'm guilty of, I agree. I'm perfect to give you this message. As a recruiting exercise, the meetings were a success. One who joined then, now a nurse, was Janet McBean. We were not spellbound by Daisy. You know, we were intelligent people who asked intelligent questions. Now remember, we, all of us came from the background that, you know, this world was going to come to an end very soon. That God was going to do something catastrophic, okay? Um, exactly what we didn't know. We, were all, we all knew a little bit about the seals. However, we had studied about the seals in a different way, and it didn't make sense. And we were young people who were searching. As well as Janet, four students at the meeting became Branch Davidian recruiters in Britain. One was her brother, theology student John McBean, who recruited in Manchester. He was to die in the fire. Livingston Fagan from Nottingham was a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor. As we've seen, he's now in prison. Cliff Sellers from Derby was another Newbold student. A gifted artist, he too would die in the fire and Diana Henry, John McBean's former girlfriend and a psychology graduate. She had two brothers and two sisters at home in Manchester. Manchester South Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Henry family used to come here. The father, Sam Henry, a builder, still worships here on a Saturday, the Adventist Sabbath. All five children were musical and destined for academic success and professional careers. John McBean was able to convince most of the Henry family to follow the sinful Messiah. Diana Henry returned after her first visit to Waco to go about recruiting Manchester Adventists using her father's church Hello. membership lists. It's me. Her father was the only member of the family to reject Corish's teaching, and the only one still alive. The fire in Waco killed Diana, both her brothers, both her sisters, and her mother, Zilla Henry. When she decided with the rest of the children to go to Waco, there was Monday and they told me this Sunday. Just a few hours, I would say, before, less than 24 hours before they went that they were going and that nearly killed me. That nearly killed me because I knew then this was serious. This came as a shock. shock to you. It was more than a shock. I put my head in my, in my hand and, and I remember kneeling right at the point and just crying my heart out. You are a bereaved husband and a bereaved father. Definitely, I am. In, 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 in this situation, have you apportioned blame for the deaths of your family? Whom do you blame? I, the main, there are two persons whom the devil use as instruments in the destruction of my family, equally. And one is, they call him David Kirsch, and the next is a woman in London called Vicky Hollingworth. I think that's her name. Why do you blame her? Because her home was the headquarters for Vernon in Britain. Victorine Hollingsworth is vacating her flat in North London. It was never a headquarters as such, but David Koresh, the self-styled Lamb of God, stayed here when he visited London. And here he held Bible meetings that convinced Vicky Hollingsworth and over 30 others to come and join him in Waco. She was allowed to leave the Mount Carmel Centre halfway through the siege. Speaking for the first time, Vicki Hollingsworth is now disillusioned with the man she once thought was a prophet and is writing a book about it. I still believe that 
that someone is to come by the name of David in setting up of God's kingdom, but... But it's not David Koresh. No, it's not David Koresh. Vicky Hollingsworth was filmed at the Mount Carmel Centre last year by an Australian cameraman. She lived here on and off for three years. Conditions were primitive. There was no sanitation. Life consisted of laborious work punctuated by lengthy sessions of Bible study addressed by the prophet himself. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Huh. Someone's the son of God. It would become clear to Vicky that Koresh's contempt for the outside world, as he called Babylon, included contempt for some of its laws and for normal standards of behavior. Someone's going to rule whether it be the world likes it or not. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The guy's tough. He's got more than guns. He's got God. Sometimes this Bible meeting is very interesting, and another time it can be very boring. He would tell us about his love affairs and things, what he did. You know, just raw, you know, what he did, how, how he do it, and things like that. And, you know, children, men and children would be there, and he just don't care. So what, what would you mean, what he did? You know, how, you know, how we make love, he would tell us. The Mount Carmel compound in the Texas countryside outside Waco had a despotic leader. Once his followers, many educated people, were convinced that Koresh was a prophet, a mouthpiece of God, they would do anything he asked of them. Koresh had married Rachel Jones, who was the 14-year-old daughter of another Branch Davidian. Together they had three children. All of them would die in the fire. But Koresh believed himself entitled to all the Davidian women. David established that um, in Isaiah 2.22, it says, Cease ye from man. And this is one of the prophecies that, that David showed us, that um, shows the men or the women that they have to leave their wife. Or if it's a woman, she has to leave her husband and her, and her boyfriend and become his wife. So he, so he used a verse of Isaiah yes. to justify sleeping with all the other men's wives? Yes, and all the men give, give their wives to David. So how many of them got pregnant? Many, many of them. So how many children do you think David Koresh had? David had many children. So, so that if any of the women were pregnant in Mount Carmel, David Koresh was the father? Yes. Because all, all, every, every man gives the wife up. Even Koresh's closest aide, Steve Schneider, had to give up his young wife, Judy, to the sinful Messiah. She had Koresh's baby and called herself Judy Schneider Koresh. The whole harem was known as the House of David. But Koresh didn't just take Davidian's wives. He demanded their young daughters, too and most parents consented. Koresh was discreet about his sex with underage children, and they left his room in the early dawn. But one Branch Davidian who later went to the police was a witness to what went on. He came to me, he had a problem. He and I were good friends, and he said that, um, that this one girl, uh, Michelle Jones, was his favorite wife and that he had been with her since um, she was 12. The problem that he was having was that she was his legal wife's sister. And there was some rivalry or jealousy developing between his legal wife and uh, this other girl. And he wasn't sure what, he, what to do about it. What did you think about David Koresh sleeping with 12-year-old children? Well, I think it was terrible, but the parents agree with it, both mother and father. They agree that um, that David should do that because you see David established that he's the only he's the only man on this earth who 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 have uh, holy seed in him. Holy seed. Yes. Yeah. That's and what he called it. Yeah, he called it the holy seed, and that he could have righteous children. If Koresh broke the law, it was the county sheriff who should have intervened. The Waco sheriff habitually turned a blind eye to Koresh's activities. But when Mark Brough defected, 
and made allegations of child abuse, Sheriff Jack Harwell eventually sent social workers to visit the Branch Davidians. There was really no evidence of, of child abuse. It was only allegations. And, and again, I say today that we have not ever found any, any proof of any child abuse out there. That's not to say that there wasn't child abuse now. I, I in my own thoughts and in my own feelings, feel that there could have been some child abuse, especially ch sexual abuse. Uh, but we could never prove that. Wayne Martin was David Koresh's legal advisor, but took his turn helping construct the flimsy wooden building. Thinking himself safe from the law, Koresh committed more excesses. Martin was one of the so-called mighty men, King David of the Old Testament had mighty men to enforce discipline, so did David Koresh. There was a paddle with which Koresh beat his followers, and he intimidated them by openly boasting in crude detail about even worse brutality upon Julie Martinez, who feared for her young daughter and wanted to leave. What I'm saying here now is not hearsay. This is what David told us, and it's by the meeting. What he did, he took Julie upstairs in his room and he, he pushed her, he pushed her on his bed and he, he raped her. He said to her that, you know, that his dick was so hard and he told us everything that what he did to her. He pushed his dick inside of her, and he said that he was very, very rough with her. And she was crying and crying and crying. For entertainment, Koresh forced the Branch Davidians to watch violent and horrific videos, usually of films about the Vietnam War, to instill a militant and defensive mentality. Koresh had guns from the beginning, and he made his mighty men into trained marksmen. His weapons were part of his, his message. You see, if there was going to be a war, and God's people had also to be warriors, and so there was that element of religion as well, that, that we had to be trained as warriors for the Lord. On several occasions, they had uh, displayed guns where people would back into their driveway or uh, show some indication that they were going on to their property and guns were revealed people coming out of the, the buildings out there with guns and whatever. There was some reference to it as being their country. You know, I, I would not go out there onto their property without letting them have knowledge that I was coming to their property. But of all Koresh's dubious activities, it was gun dealing that would bring him into conflict with authority. One of his members had a dealer's license and drove to cities like Houston to buy and sell at gun fairs. Koresh financed his sex by trading in weapons, a commonplace enough business in Texas. This was Koresh's business premises, a building near Mount Carmel called the Mag Bag. Here, Koresh took receipt of mail order firearms from all over America, including machine guns like the AK-47, the simple kits that convert semi-automatic weapons into automatics, and even hand grenades. Fully assembled, they're all illegal. Only when a package burst open did the sheriff receive a tip-off from the postal service, UPS. Uh, UPS uh, called us one time on some hand grenade hulls, uh, the kind that you would use set on your desk for paperweights. A uh, box of them had, had uh, they were delivering had uh, they had damaged the box and some of them had fallen out and they called us to go out and look at them they were not the illegal so we couldn't stop them from delivering them and then we received information black powder and and uh, other uh, types of uh, conversion kits for semi-automatic rifles to convert them to automatic rifles and that kind of thing all of this information we were giving to the federal people, ATF, who are responsible for uh, investigating and controlling these kind of activities. As a result, this house opposite Koresh's compound was occupied in January by agents of the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Bureau, the ATF. 
an agent called Rodriguez infiltrated Bible classes, and a log was kept of Koresh's movements. Warrants were issued to arrest Koresh and to search Mount Carmel for illegal weapons. Koresh used regularly to drive into Waco in his black sports car. He had no fear of arrest. Last week, a government report said that if the ATF had arrested Koresh in town, all the mayhem that followed need never have happened, and those who died might still have been alive. Instead, the ATF decided to mount its biggest ever raid. Over a hundred armed agents set out for Mount Carmel. The raid was meant to have speed, simplicity and surprise. Speed, the ATF agents were transported here in cattle trucks that were visible from miles away. Simplicity, the raid was preceded by three military helicopters that were fired upon before the cattle trucks even got here. Surprise, the raid had been talked about in Waco for days. The news media were alerted and were following the police convoy. One television news cameraman got lost near here and asked a postman for directions, adding, there's going to be a big gunfight with those religious nuts over there. The postman thanked him for the warning and drove back to Mount Carmel. He was David Jones, David Koresh's brother-in-law and one of the mighty men. Withering fire from the Davidians' automatic weapons greeted the ATF men when they tried to enter the building. Last week's report reveals that not only was Koresh forewarned of the raid, but the ATF's undercover agent Rodriguez had told that to the raid's commanders. The report says they should have called off the operation once the element of surprise was lost. With both sides suffering dead and wounded, Davidian lawyer Wayne Martin put in a desperate call to the deputy sheriff, Larry Lynch, who he knew. Against the background of gunfire, the call was recorded. Yeah, this is Lieutenant Lynch, may I help you? Yeah, they're shooting at us in Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel? Yeah, tell them there are children and women in here and to call it off. God almighty. I can hear the bullets. God almighty, I knew this. Wayne? with the forces now. Stand by. Why do you think such extreme violence was used against law enforcement officers when they arrived to carry out their duties? Well, because it was provoked. Because the ATF provoked it. Violence begets violence. And when the ATF assaulted uh, those people, they defended themselves. When you think about 100 plus people inside of a compound with all of those weapons, you need to amass a large scale operation. The important thing was that it go forward only with the element of surprise. Unfortunately, the element of surprise was lost and the operation still went forward. Ronald Noble's report concedes that with four ATF men killed and 16 wounded, the raid was a fiasco. But there could be no let up now. Koresh was confronting not just the local sheriff, but the government of the United States. Federal officers were dead. A tragic process began to unfold, and faced with an intransigence they could not understand, officials made a series of misjudgments that would end in even greater loss of life. David Koresh and his followers were where they wanted to be, inside the fortress of Mount Carmel. They settled down for a long siege, and so did the outside world. President Clinton replaced the ATF with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Meanwhile, the army provided armoured vehicles and helicopters. The aim was to get the Davidians to give themselves up. But over the succeeding weeks, only a handful came out. The rest chose to stay. Anybody else want to look through the field glasses? They don't talk. Last week's report for the Justice Department acknowledges that the FBI's tactics didn't work. Instead of a swift resolution, the siege dragged on into its second month. Initially, the FBI's fear was that there'd be a mass suicide. When Vicki Hollingsworth came out after three weeks, she confirmed that fear. Yvette Fagan, she brought uh, a green thing 
a wrong thing and she gave it to one of the ladies, I cannot remember which one, saying that, um, you know, that, you know, it's a grenade and it's going to be quick death. Even in that early part of the siege, a decision had been made that you were all going to die. That we all going to die, and they all, they, that, that, they, that they're going to blow the place up. So a mass suicide, that, um, the, you know, pe the people were planning a mass suicide in the first few days of the siege. Is this because David Koresh had persuaded everybody that their lives would have to end in this siege? Well, David said that we were at the end. Everyone believed that they were, that the time must come, that we were at the end of the world. If that was the mood in the early days of the siege, later on the FBI knew Koresh's attitude may have changed. Koresh's lawyer, Dick Tagerin, was one of the few the FBI allowed to speak to him. Tagerin gave Panorama evidence that Koresh intended to survive the siege, the tape of a phone conversation late in the siege that has not been heard publicly before. This is where my focus is. Once I go out here, I want to go out walking. I told him, you know, I had no intention of committing suicide. I'm not that way. Let me tell you, the word they're spreading is that you have vowed to kill all, everybody. Uh, alone. Uh, that it would be a mass suicide. I know it. It's... It, Koresh told Daguerin that he'd give himself up once he'd written his prophetic interpretation of the Seven Seals. We know Koresh started work because the computer disk containing his first chapter survived the fire. Although the FBI thought this another delaying tactic, it helped persuade them that mass suicide was unlikely and that it was therefore safe to force a conclusion. At dawn on April the 19th, 51 days into the siege, their patience ran out. President Clinton authorized the FBI's tanks to bash holes in the walls, spray CS gas, and fire in gas canisters. Over loudspeakers, the FBI told the Davidians it was not an assault, just an attempt to force them out. But the Davidians stayed put. Last week's report would call the entire gassing operation a failure. What you had was FBI agents who were trained to be proactive, to be, to do things, to force a conclusion. They didn't have to do something. It's this macho attitude, we've got to bring this to a conclusion that I'm arguing about. I think the best conclusion would have happened if they just let it happen rather than trying to force the issue on April the 19th. Uh, it, was a, it was a wrong decision. Six hours after the gassing operation began around midday, the Mount Carmel Center burst into flames in three different places. About a hundred were inside, just nine escaped. One told me his experience. On the phone from Waco Prison, British survivor Renos Avram. Um, I myself went for the nearest exit, which was out the window. I was shooting everyone else down. It was sort of panicked and I could hear quite a few people running, running by the corridors on the first floor. Um, I myself came out of the first floor window. Um, a lot of, a lot of entities had already been blocked by the tank for knocking down, you know, parts of the building. How did the fire start? At the time, the government didn't expect a mass suicide. But FBI agents are now hinting they knew the fire might happen. They had listening devices in the building, and early on the 19th, allegedly heard Koresh ordering paraffin to be splashed around. The Justice Department won't release those tapes, but its investigator has no doubts. There is substantial evidence uh, that demonstrates that the fire was caused by those inside the compound. Not just caused by them, but that it was intentionally set. Uh, we do have interviews with a number of members who had exited the compound, indicating that there was um, in, uh, um, petroleum-type products that were being spread around the compound. Uh, that the fires were set at about the time that the, uh, uh, that the armor vehicles began breaching the walls of the compound. I think the evidence will be overwhelming that that fire was set intentionally by Koresh and some of his core followers. But the British eyewitness, Renos Avram, says the fire was started by accident. I was in there with the time, and uh, there was no uh, proof of any 
But as the fire here at Mount Carmel started in three separate places, the FBI is probably right that it was deliberate, but there is no proof of mass suicide. The question remains, therefore, whether the FBI was wise to force the issue with the gas attack or whether it aggravated the situation. The Justice Department report exonerates the FBI, but many in America have received that report skeptically. To avoid an agonizing death by fire, many Davidians shot one another or themselves. David Koresh had already been wounded. FBI agents now believe that it was his trusted lieutenant, Steve Schneider, who had given Koresh everything, including his own wife, who shot the sinful messiah in the head with a rifle before turning the gun on himself. No weapon was found near the body of David Koresh. A high velocity rifle lay beside the remains of Steve Schneider. The flag of Texas symbolized the reassertion of state authority over Koresh's kingdom. What little remained of victims of the fire was carried away for identification and autopsy. The survivors and the government cannot agree about responsibility for their deaths. Among them, young Cliff Sellers, John McBean, the Henry family, Wayne Martin and four of his children. Why did all so many people have to die like this? Why did they, you know, when you think that they were in the one place, there was 32, and that square place that was over there, it was a pantry. Some of them were so fused together. They were holding each other. There was like five or six bodies at one point. They realized later that these people all meshed together. Such a heat and such a, a closeness. They were afraid. They would not have done this. They wouldn't have allowed them, you know, selves to want to kill themselves like that. They didn't want to die. We all wanted to live. I know my children too. In order to make his own sort of um, prophetic vision come true, um, he decided to stage a fire in which it would make it appear as though uh, this was the result of some sort of uh, armed confrontation between law enforcement and his group. But actually, he wasn't given what he wanted, which I believe was an armed conflict between law enforcement and his group in which he expected to die, in which he expected his membership to die. The shattered mementos of the sect decay on the devastated site of Mount Carmel. Koresh has been demonized by the government and his followers ridiculed as cultists. They became the object of public outrage and loathing, and very few stopped to think about what had happened. The true test of a free society is not in how it treats its best citizens, but in how it treats its worst, its most despised. And if we can do that, to someone because, well, they're religious nuts, or they're, they're a little bit different, or they're a lot different, and we can do it to you or me or anyone else, and that troubles me. What remained of David Koresh was secretly buried here, in this unmarked grave in the small Texas town where he grew up. The Branch Davidian sect still exists. Its members believe Koresh will return soon, and today they are still actively trying to make converts in Britain and wherever people are susceptible to the appeal of a sinful messiah.